Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you, Donald. Good evening, everybody. Well, the President wasn't mentioned at all in the Queen's speech today, as had been expected. We thought a state visit was coming this autumn. And, well, what a day it was. I'd said to you yesterday that it would be the most extraordinary spectacle, that the eyes of the world would be on uh, the state carriage as it made its way to the Sovereign's entrance, and I couldn't have been more wrong. Because for the first time since 1974, uh, the whole pomp and circumstance element of the Queen's speech was considerably toned down. Uh, She didn't even wear the robes that she normally does. So it was a very, very much uh, reduced and toned down Queen's speech in that way. Uh, But it was also a remarkable Queen's speech, not for what was in it, but for what wasn't in it. And I've sort of been wondering, I mean, if you're one of the 13.5 million people that voted for a Conservative manifesto, I wonder how you're feeling this evening, because, uh, you know, the changes to school meals, well, that wasn't there, but it had been in the manifesto. The changes to welfare and social care, albeit very controversial, they, of course, weren't in the Queen's speech. Uh, the pension reforms that were being talked about, that wasn't in the Queen's speech. Grammar schools, something that I've campaigned for for 20 years, and I genuinely thought we would see a push uh, for grammar schools, that wasn't in the Queen's speech. And perhaps some of you living in the country uh, would have voted Conservative because you thought that there might be a free vote in this Parliament on fox hunting legislation and that wasn't there either. So there are, I think, likely to be a lot of Conservatives thinking, golly, what did we actually vote for? Well, there were 27 proposed new pieces of law, eight of which concerned Brexit, and this Queen's speech, unusually again, wasn't for one year, as we normally expect, but actually for two years. Um, I have to say, I thought the whole thing was pretty unexciting. I I thought the Prime Minister did seem somewhat diminished by recent events, including, of course, the election. Uh, Perhaps the highlight of the whole thing, as Black Rod summoned the House of Commons to go across to the Peers' Chamber to listen to the monarch, perhaps the highlight came from the veteran, uh, beast of Bolsover, Dennis Skinner, who said, we better get a move on. The first race at Ascot starts at 2.30, which I think was certainly the most humorous part of it. Uh, But I'm, you know, I, I have to say there are things that I would like to have seen in this Queen's speech, particularly in areas such as counter-terrorism, where, frankly, the wording was pretty vague, it seemed to me. But I'm asking you, what would you have liked to have seen in today's Queen's speech? And perhaps you're with me on grammar schools. I don't know. If you are, call on 0345 973 Maybe you were hoping for a free vote on fox hunting. In that case, text me on 84850. Or, frankly, well, within reason, any suggestion you want that you think might have been a constructive thing for this government to do over the course of the next two years, then you can tweet me on at LBC, not forgetting, of course, the hashtag Farage and LBC. And as ever, you can watch us live on Facebook by going to LBC's Facebook page now. Simon, in Stockwell, what was missing for you in today's Queen's speech, or was it the complete package? Oh, good evening, Nigel. Pleasure to speak to you. What was missing for me was a problem that's been brewing in this country for years and years and years. Safety of the public from terrorism. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, I think the last incidents in this country, I hate to say it, are just the start. I, I, I don't like to be a doom monger, but what I want to see is us, the public, who pay, pay for the army, who pay for the secret squirrels, you know, them ones who... Yeah. who, who who follow these people, there's, apparently there's 20 of them following it, and it's all coming out of taxpayers' money. I'd like to see us, the public, when we get on the train, if, they haven't, if they've got not enough armed police, they'll have to put the army, they'll have to put a single unit army person, because at the end of the day, we, the public, we, we, we are paying for our protection, you know? Well, Simon, what the Queen's speech said is that they would do whatever it took uh, in terms of giving our police force um, and our services the powers that they need uh, to deal with counter-terrorism. That is what the Queen's speech said. But then, kind of, Simon, it says that sort of thing every year, virtually, doesn't it? And I, I'm, I'm a little bit with you on this. I think, given... And don't forget, we've had 
uh, the incidents here. But don't forget, last night at Brussels Central train station, there was an incident. There was an incident the day before that in the Champs-Élysées and an incident the day before that in Italy. So some kind of terrorist attempt, albeit mostly by lone wolves, but some kind of terrorist attempt is now, I regret to say, Simon, almost becoming a daily occurrence on the European continent. Uh, and I'm with you. What specifically, Simon? So, so you would like to have seen a commitment to using the army a bit more who are trained to use firearms? Nigel, I was in Paris three years ago, and I've got to tell you, I love France as a country. There's people from certain, a lot of French people who don't even go to Paris. Now, is this the way we want London to be? Because I can tell you now, I was on the tubes today. There was no, I, I, I travelled from, I, I must have done an 18-mile journey. I had to go somewhere. Yep. I had to change a couple of times. I never saw one policeman. I never saw one army personnel. I, I, I walked through barriers that, that were open. I mean, is that top security? I mean, in the end of the day, it's all very well the politicians being guarded and, and, and then, then, then being... I, I'm talking about the public. I'm, I, I think we need to get boots on the ground, no matter what way they do it. The thing is, if there's 20 of them following these jihadists around, we, the public... We should demand protection. And as I said, I was in Paris three years ago. I've seen how bad it can get where people are actually... Well, there's French people. And I, I have to say, Simon, scared to go to Paris. you do have a point about Paris. I'm afraid Paris really has gone very seriously downhill. And yes, I've heard lots of French people, particularly when I've been in Strasbourg, saying how sad they are to see what Paris has become. Any French listeners, particularly those here in London, who disagree with that and still think Paris is fantastic, well, Paris is still fantastic. It's just there are parts of it that don't feel very safe. Simon, thank you for your call. Simon thinks the counter-terrorism should have been a lot tougher, and I must admit that is probably my main take out of today as well. Uh, Kassam in Mill Hill, um, come on, what about the Queen's speech? Did you enjoy it? What I enjoyed most about the Queen's speech was just what she wore. She wore the EU colours, um, sort of encouraging unity, sort of inspiring, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really believe that, do you? Oh, I believe that every day of the week, seven, seven days a year. I'm telling you that right now. now. Hang on, hang on. Whoa down there. So, OK, I know. Now, this, of course, is the biggest hat week of the year because it's Ascot. It's Royal Ascot, uh, which started yesterday and i was supposed to be going tomorrow but i've had to scrap it because i'm going to the european summit um and of course all the newspapers every week are looking for the best hats and years ago there was a woman called mrs Schilling, and what she wore would often make the front pages so i get kasam that it is a hat week um, and for those that have got no idea what kasam is talking about well the queen wore a blue outfit she didn't wear the ceremonial robes as i mentioned earlier and she wore a blue hat that had five uh, yellow, uh, well, what would you call them, Kassam? Stars? That's what you yeah, think, I isn't it? That's, that's what you pretty think. Pretty so Kassam thinks that she wore the EU flag on her head as a sign that Brexit's been a disaster, and that's exactly what Guy Verhofstadt, uh, the European Parliament Euro fanatic, uh, thinks as well. Um, I've, I've said to Verhofstadt on Twitter, and I say to you, Kassam, I think that's just wishful thinking. Wish you were thinking you might think, but I believe that's completely wrong. It's a fascist statement, if anything. And the days do add up, Nigel, you are my father. And I also believe that if you encourage more security and the Queen can inspire this, it will be very useful for the future. <laughs> but you honestly don't think the Queen thinks we should reverse Brexit, do you? No, I, I, no, I, I do believe that um, the Queen, she doesn't want to reverse Brexit, but she wants to show that, like you, you, you know, you, like you said yourself, and terrorism is creeping on the daily, yeah. on, the, on, 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 you know, on the minute list. And we need to sort of, as, as a whole country and as a whole co like continent, we need to sort of, you know, sort of combine together and just the Queen can well, take it. I, th not I, I think, uh, Kassam, the, the more deeply we combine, I mean, we're going the other way, thank goodness, but the more deeply we combine with the continent, the worse terrorism is likely to get, because I'm afraid uh, that their policies on this have led to too many people coming into the EU in the last couple of years claiming to be refugees, uh, but actually have come in with bad intent. That's what the terrorists want you to believe, and this is what we need to be ahead of them by like four or five steps. And this is why I believe that if we do get the Queen to be more patriotic and more pushing, pushing unity, that's what, what bad can happen? Well, I'll tell you what the Queen will do, and you know I know she's ninety-one, but what the Queen will do, and what she's always done, is she will continue to push unity 
with 52 countries who have a combined population of 2.3 billion, and it's called the Commonwealth, and she's the head of it, and she's massively proud of it. Uh, and I think uh, one thing that we will get from Brexit, Kassam, is more chances to get closer to that wonderful global array of nations in the Commonwealth. I find that rather exciting, don't you? I do, and I believe the, the Queen's going to finesse it like she always does. The Queen's been the, she's been the Queen of finessing it throughout the year. She's been doing a great job. Yeah. I believe yeah. Carries on going that way, keep on showing what she can do. I mean, she'll just screw around to the good positions, in my opinion. Kassam, thank you for your call. Kassam, a huge fan of the Queen. He thinks whatever she does, she's marvellous, but he believes there was a message of European unity there today from her hat. I have to tell you, I do not believe that. Uh, Colin on Facebook says, The Queen's speech shows that Theresa May has no vision. I felt embarrassed that Her Majesty had to read it. And Chris says, I'm so glad that the fox hunting ban stands. I was disappointed with May when she said she wanted to introduce a free vote. Well, disappointed, Chris, you may have been, but kind of... I asked this a couple of weeks ago. Is there any point now to manifestos? I mean, I, I never in my life can I think of a general election manifesto, some of which was broken even before the election, and the whole point of a Queen's speech is to take that manifesto and to lay it out in terms of a legislative agenda, and it clearly hasn't happened. Must be a lot of very disappointed Conservative voters out there, that's all I can say. It was a Queen's speech that was notable for what wasn't in it, including most of the Conservative manifesto, uh, from which they became not a majority government, but the biggest party just a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things I'd expected was to hear the Queen say that President Trump was going to be visiting the country on an official state visit. We'd all been told this was going to happen in October. And then we heard... Uh, from White House sources within the last couple of weeks that actually they were thinking of postponing the trip. They were worried about large-scale protests. And I thought to myself, this is really worrying. You know, we cannot get to the stage where mob rule, you know, stops a foreign leader coming to our country. So I was concerned that the Trump visit wasn't there. We heard that the King and Queen of Spain were going to come, but we didn't get anything about President Trump. And I really hope that President Trump does come to this country because he is a key component of where we go post-Brexit. America offers us some big opportunities. Boris Johnson has cheered me up a little bit. Well, he often does. And he said on Sky News, the visit will go ahead, believe me. The formality is you cannot put the date of the President's state visit into the Queen's speech until it has been actually agreed. Uh, well, Boris, you may be right. I expect Donald Trump will come. I know next month he's going to be in Poland. He's going to be in Germany. So perhaps he'll come not on a state visit. Perhaps he'll come to meet Mrs May or whoever the Prime Minister is in a few weeks' time. But I'm asking you, what would you like to have seen in this Queen's speech? Because, frankly... Other than a lot of bills about Brexit, which is pretty natural, given the next two years, there wasn't really much, very much inspiring there. Jason in Hornchurch, what would you like to have seen? Hello, Nigel. What pleasure to speak to you. Good um, evening. I would like to have seen um, both of your full guns blazing for fracking. Fracking? Um, fracking. Yeah. Um, that basically, the energy security that this country now needs, rather than relying on basically untested nuclear technology, which is what they're doing at Hinkley Point, throwing billions at it, uh -huh. the effect, effectively, you know, what, it, what it's done for America. It's done amazing things for, effectively for their manufacturing, as in lowering their energy costs. The Boland shell in the north of England is 10 times the thickness of the Marcella shell in the U.S. By all geologists, uh, the shell, with, well, basically, it's mostly all over England. Um, a lucky sturgeon, it's not in Scotland. But um, <laughs> it's world class. It's absolutely world class. And it's, 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 it's you know, we've been lucky through our, uh, for our geology that we've had coal, yeah. and now we've got shell, and we should be utilising it. But, Jason, in the last few weeks, there's been a, a pretty strong campaign saying that wind energy is now providing wonderful things for our energy needs. Are you, I mean, are, are you telling me that you're sceptical about that? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> right. uh, very often because uh, when I had to go around the university, you never actually blowing or they seem to be on, on fire or shredding birds, which um, I don't particularly find it particularly environmentally friendly. Um, uh, you know, th this is a massive resource, a massive resource. Yep. We, right now, with Brexit, we need to be all guns blazing on what we've got. We've got a 
huge resource in natural resource. We should be doing that. We should be going to hell to hell ever for things like Skylon, which is the, 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 the really the, uh, the child of Hotel, which would, you know, a plane that will get you from London to uh, Sydney in three hours. These are the well, sort that's, of things. Uh, okay, maybe that's going a little bit too far for this conversation no, but, right yeah, now. But, but well, Jason, you're basically saying there's a lack of vision on energy, and we're looking at a gift horse in the mouth given the Boland shale gas resources, yeah? Exactly, and it's not just the Boland, the Dan and the Weald Basin, it's all over in Wales. There is a huge, huge resource that we are just not tapping into, yeah. and probably the Americans must think we're mad. Well, <laughs> there's been a very effective PR campaign against fracking, hasn't there? And a lot of people, Jason, a lot of people in this country are very concerned about what fracking might do to their district. Yes, uh, you know, but uh, it has been proven in America. A lot of these videos that where you know you saw like flames coming out of uh, yeah, taps and yeah. that they were completely false. And very often these places that had, that had this problem for all all time, you know, from the point that they actually had a tap going, purely because of the geology actually of that particular area, particularly in Pennsylvania. Um, it's it, as I say, it's just this, yeah. it's, we have really got to utilise what we've got if we're going to survive. Because there's no doubt about it, the French and the Germans are going to try and hurt us. A million miles. That's what they're going to do. I thought they were our allies and our friends. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the French and German people are lovely people. Unfortunately, the people that have always from France, and particularly the people that once Germany, have always hated us. And it's just, uh, <laughs> the way. Jason, thank you. But a very heartfelt pledge there from Jason that we need to get real on energy, uh, to start fracking, to start bringing down prices, to start giving us... I think what Jason means is he wants us to have a competitive advantage over the rest of the EU. Burkan in Sidcup, what was missing in today's Queen's speech for you? May's resignation. Right. <laughs> well, I think, to be honest, they had to sort of get the government going, didn't they? So that wasn't going to happen today. But what's yeah. wrong... Come on, what's wrong with Prime Minister May Burkan? Well, first things first, before I get started, I just want to say I told you so. Mm -hmm. I rang you a few times and I told I you remember, she, was yeah. gonna, she was obviously trying to lose this election. She, everyone says she didn't lose the election. Basically, she's in power, but she's powerless. So yes. let's get that straight. Yes. Um, second of all, what your last caller said. Now, I'm, I'm a big, uh, big uh, innovator in uh, energy, but I'm not the sort of energy he wants to do. I'm, I'm more into wind and um, solar energy. And I think China right now are doing such a great job. They're going to be running the running the world soon with it. I mean, taking us out the with, with Trump, especially taking us taking America out of the Paris Agreement. I think China now is leading the the world in uh, electrical and wind and solar energy. But but Birkin, think, Birkin, it all sounds lovely until yeah. you realise that with wind energy, there is massive, huge, fast taxpayer subsidy. Maybe so, but the, uh, to be honest, the re real reason why people don't want to go solar and wind is because the bankers can't put it on the market. So they can't do it per barrel or per whatever they do with their oil and other Look, things. I tell, you, I tell you what, Birkin, I think with wind energy and with renewables, forget the bankers, I think what you've seen with that is one of the greatest transfers of money from poor people to rich people that we've seen in our lifetimes. You know, landowners earning thousands of pounds a week or even a day in some cases, for simply siting these wind turbines on their land. And who's paying? All of us, through energy bills, domestic energy bills, that by 2020 will be 20% higher than they should be because we're giving money to the rich. How does that economically make sense? Well, you sort of just nailed the head on the argument there. So, <laughs> But what I can say is maybe it can help us with that... It, instead of paying people that own the land, we, the government should buy the land. And well, instead of us paying X amount of money to energy companies or making extortion of fees, maybe we should put it towards the government who can make the money and pay off the deficit. Well, well maybe. I mean, Birkin, you were right. You did see, before the election, that she was in trouble. What else would you like to have seen in this Queen's speech, barring her, resi <laughs> barring her resignation? <laughs> well, I think me and you both want to see that. But one thing I would like to see is, uh, well, well, actually, I, I just don't want to hear anything about her gone, to be honest. I really think she's weak. I think she's cowardly. 
I think she's hanging on to power like Sylvester Stallone in Cl- Cliffhanger. <laughs> and I just, I just, I just don't believe she should be there. Birkin, she just doesn't look like she wants to be there. I have to say, she did not look a very happy bunny today, did she? No, I agree with you. Birkin, as ever, hugely entertaining, and I thank you. Uh, the Queen's speech. I wanted to hear fair deal for those who have done the right things all their lives. Josie, ex-teacher, robbed of state pension for six years. Unacceptable waiting times for cancer. Cancer ops and chemo. I have to say, you are not alone, Josie. A lot of women feel like that, uh, particularly given what happened on their pensions. Hi, Nigel. I would like to have seen a reduction in the foreign aid budget to put back into our essential services, says Val. Val, I suspect that would pick up quite a lot of support. Glad to see she dropped her plan to reverse the Hunting Act. Well, uh, I think, Mark, in Oxford, the point about that is that she was talking about having a free vote in Parliament as it, as opposed to it being, you know, a Conservative policy upon which people would have been whipped. Uh, Cathy thinks that the Queen's speech should have included trying to put morals and standards back into our society. Can't run a government on economics only. <laughs> John in Northampton, what I mean, do you think it was was it a complete package for you or not? Well, the whole thing is not a complete package. It's a waste of time, if you ask me. <laughs> right. this government altogether, I think we're just heading down a completely, you know, an alleyway of uncertainty, which only ends with a, you know, a very bad ending. But either way, we we keep going. But I, I just, I, I mean, people like you, Nigra, you you guys must be fairly intelligent to get to the position that you've got. Oh, not, not necessarily, John, no, but go on. Well, I, well I'd assume not. If, if, it, if, you, if you can't call it intelligence, I'd, I'd have thought you've had enough exposure to oh. understand the way the world works. Because the way I see the world is you just got a whole lot of injustice. And, and we keep talking about, uh, you know, uh, the threat of ISIS, the threat of al-Qaeda, the threat of this, the threat of that. Do people not understand that there is a war? And there has been a war in the Middle East for the past of, like, 50 years. Yeah, go on. If, if, if there's a war in the Middle East, that means there's going to be people from the Middle East that hate the Western world. And I think the million-dollar question is, are those wars in the Middle East necessary? And I think the answer is no. Well, I think, John, because... John, John, I think, I think that the Iraq war was perhaps a bit of a turning point with this, wasn't it? Well, I, 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 to me, it was a disgrace. It's an absolute disgrace. Yeah. And you've got 1.5 million people dead, at least. For, for what? Mm. Well, yeah, but we can't turn the clock back on that. I mean, what could what could the Queen have said on behalf of the government today that might have improved any of that? No, well, we can talk about our own foreign policy and how we treat people. I mean, we've got, we've got look at the, the fire in London now, the tower block. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's not about a tower block. It's how people are being treated. It's how poor people in this world are being treated... Expect, right. You know, so you would like to have heard more <coughs> from the Queen about injustice in society and in the world, yeah? No, I'd, I'd like to hear about foreign policy and how we stop. OK, well, John, we got precious little of that. I thank you for your call. Foreign policy really barely featuring. Well, today's Queen's speech was a pretty uninspiring occasion. And I'm asking you, what would you like to have seen in it? And I have to ask that question because there wasn't really very much in it. Uh, you know, quite a few bills about Brexit, obviously, because that will be very important over the course of the next few years. Vast chunks of the Tory manifesto not appearing at all. I was disappointed that the commitment to grammar schools had been dropped. I was very disappointed not to see some strong stronger measures and language about counter-terrorism, which I think is very, very important. Uh, But generally, not one of you, not a single one of you, has phoned in, texted, tweeted or Facebook messaged to say you think it actually was a terrific Queen's speech and this government has got off to a rip-roaring start. 0345 6060 If you think today's Queen's speech got it about right... Alexander in Sheffield, what would you like to have seen in this Queen's speech? And good evening. Hi, Nigel. Pleasure to speak to you. Well, I've been listening to the show, and I have to say, was we expecting anything less from uh, this Queen's speech? I mean, the the manifesto was probably the worst Conservative manifesto that has been published in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is comparable to... To Foot's uh, to Foot's election manifesto in 1983. I mean, it was awful. She abandoned the ideal of home ownership. Um, so I was I was happy she included uh, the promise to bring back 
grammars, but that's been completely that's, abandoned. Yeah, but that's been shredded, Alexander, hasn't it? It has. I mean, uh, uh, this Conservative government, really, can it call itself Conservative when it is really a Blairite, a blue Blairite government in disguise. I mean, that there was nothing conservative about mm. the Queen's speech that mm. uh, was written today. I, do, do you know what? It's funny you say that, because I think on the Tory backbenches, there are quite a lot of mutterings going on. Are we really, oh, yes, a, are we really a conservative party at all? So there is a lot of that going on. Um, I mean, how long do you think? I mean, do you think she's going to survive as Prime Minister? Well, it's um, funny that you say that, Nigel, because uh, I've been I've been hearing I've been hearing a lot of mumblings um, with the uh, local membership and uh, the Conservative voters that I that I am uh, quite familiar with. I think that. So, think so let's just get this straight, Alexander. You're an activist in the Conservative Party, are you? Um, well, I am. I am a member. Yes. Uh, and, and a voter, but I don't really get involved in the activism. All right. Uh, but I am. I am quite familiar with uh, groups within the party, and I, I feel like um, she will. She will stay in for Brexit. But once uh, the Brexit negotiations are over with, I think that she'll be out the front door. Right. Right. Alexander, a disappointed Conservative. Thank you. I think there are going to be quite a lot of those out there somehow. Um, I, I, Alison says, Nigel, I would like to have seen the return of grammar schools. Their standard of tuition brought out the best in pupils at all levels. Maybe the Queen knows something, that the five stars on her represent the five founder members of the EU. This time next year, they will be the only ones left. It wasn't five founder members, it was six. Anyway, there we are, people having fun with the Queen's hat today. Laura in Cromer, what was missing or was it brilliant? Um, it wasn't brilliant, certainly wasn't brilliant. Right. I think that it would have been really good to see something on bringing the country together. I don't think I've ever experienced it so divided. So you've got leavers versus remainers, the old versus the young, the rich versus the poor, Mm -hmm. um, the left versus right, in a way that I've never experienced in my lifetime. And, you know, she stood on, she stood outside Downing Street when she became Prime Minister talking about unity, and she campaigned on various strange things, including, apparently, at some point, unity, but then there was nothing about it. Well, I mean, Laura, you could argue that in the mid-1980s, there were some pretty strong divisions in the country with, you know, miners' strikes, etc. So I don't think it's... I, 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 I remember the 80s. I'm quite old. And I... Well, I didn't want to ask. <laughs> and I have genuinely never experienced division like this on so mm. many levels. Yeah, sure, the miners are striking, the print unions are striking. Yep. And, uh, you know, and, and there was a lot of stuff going on. But communities were held together in a way. Families were held together in a way that, that I, I haven't... that I'm not seeing this time around. And it's just I'm just seeing an awful lot of anger, and it's not even mm. it's not even people just on the losing side who are angry. So you know, kind of after the referendum, there was an awful lot of anger from Leave voters still, and an awful lot of anger and sorrow from Remain voters yep. too. But but now you know, kind of either, this time around, people are st- you know after an election, we usually all go, oh God, you know, didn't get what we wanted or did get. The well, we that's wanted. the point about democracy, Laura. Democracy is supposed to be that safety valve that you say, yeah, hey, we won, or boo, we lost but we'll win next time. And yet that isn't quite happening, is it? Because people on the losing sides here uh, don't seem to me to be satisfied with the democratic process. I think, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure it's as simple as that. I think that's quite a binary of thinking of it. I think more that nobody's happy with anything that's happening. And I think that it's very easy to, re- to blame something like being in the EU or having a Tory government or something like that. But I think there's something deeper going on within the country. Because if you look at it, if you look at kind of the best-selling books and the charts and all of the things that people are talking about lifestyle-wise, it's all about mental health, well-being, trying to be happy. And... It just seems that nobody is happy, and I don't think anyone's addressing mm. those deep root well, causes. Well, Laura, to be fair to the government, and, and you know, mental health did get a specific mention in the Queen's speech today, and it is going to be bolstered and boosted. So perhaps that's one thing that you can give a cheer for.
that is one good thing. I mean, I don't think she went far enough in terms of not talking about learning disabilities and the disparity in employment, which was part of the manifesto. Hmm. But, um, but I think that I think it's deeper than that. It's great that men- the mental health will be treated, and it's great that they will, um, you know, because I'll put it on a par with physical health. But I don't think anyone's looking at why there are so many mental health problems, and it is because we are an incredibly unhappy, divided country, you know, in part. And I and I really think that the only way forward, sure, we're leaving the EU. That's fine. But I think the only way forward now is to kind of get the, you know, for them to get the Brexit stuff done, but to find a way of bringing the country back together. Okay, okay. Laura, no, you made your points very well. And Laura saying how divided uh, the country is in many ways. Well, of course, today was supposed to be the day of rage, uh, as you know, and a march uh, came through central London, down Whitehall, into Parliament Square today. Um, their numbers uh, were not that great. Uh, They did lie in the road and stop the traffic. There was some violence towards a police officer, uh, but perhaps this did not happen on the scale some had feared. Though, on July the 1st, this is planned to happen in a much, much bigger way. And I've been quite critical over the last week of the Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell, calling for a million people to take to the streets to bring down the government. And I repeat the point I just made to Laura in Norfolk. The point about elections is you might not like the result... But you accept the result. We have elections to stop us being violent. Maybe the reason that the crowds of protesters weren't that big today is that it was the hottest day in London since 1976. Perhaps it was simply too hot for the trots. Charles in Birmingham, what would you like to have seen today in the Queen's speech? I would have liked to have seen the uh, freeze pie of National House workers removed so my yeah. partner works for the NSF would get a decent salary. Yeah. Because um, she works in the mental health department side. Ah. Let me tell you, her saying this mental health yeah. is the biggest load of rubbish I've ever heard. Because my on. partner's just finished a six-week course mm. and she's just finished her exams so she can take blood so they, can, so they don't have to pay the nurses to come in and take it and she doesn't get any extra money. And that's what they do in these places. They cut staff, but other people have to take the courses so they can replace them for nothing. Well, what do we do, Charles? Do we just keep pumping money into the NHS? No, what I'd like to see, I'd like to see the foreign aid budget completely gone for two years. Right. And all the debt we've got on all these hospitals on high finance, pay them completely off. Yeah. With all the finance and all the hospitals... Do you mean so, up, so up all the money, by that so you mean these all... these dreaded PFI deals that were done in the late nineteen yes. nineties, yeah? Yes. So then the hospitals are not using some of their budget to finance all this finance, hmm. which is what 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 happens. That's what people don't understand. In NHS. All these often these super hospitals, like we've got them in Birmingham. I have to pay for finance to keep up to pay all the payments. I know, I'm aware of this. I've spoken to hospital trusts and they've said to me that, that this, this debt overhang from PFI is a massive, massive problem. Uh, and is your partner, Charles, so opti- 30, 30. Is your partner, Charles, optimistic that at least mental health, you know, was flagged up today as something that is going to get more resources? As she said to me, she's heard it all before and she'll always hear it, but nothing ever happens. All that happens is that, as I say... Different people on different courses, and they cut, 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 cut. She'll tell you, uh, in January, they couldn't find a bed in Birmingham, and the nearest bed for this person was in Wales. They mm. had to take them by ambulance to Wales. Can't be good. Charles, thank you for your call. Charles, pretty cynical, but really not much was done there for the health service at all. Roger on Facebook agrees. Dennis Skinner got it right, that they've got to get the skates on the first races at 2.30. Skinner coming out with some top marks, I think, for today. Uh, and Jay says, people in this country need to be looked after, but see- sending endless amounts of foreign aid, particularly to rich nations, is wrong. A point just made by our last caller. There was a very strong commitment, folks, in today's Queen's speech that we will keep the foreign aid budget at 0.7% of our economy, just as David Cameron took us to in the first place. Well, the Queen's speech is not getting much positive reaction, and I've been putting out a big plea. You know, please tell me there was something good about the Queen's speech. And Tim and Lewisham says, I think you'll find there are a lot of very relieved Conservative voters out there. No dementia tax. Well, that's possibly true. Oh, and I like this one. Nigel, I think it was a great Queen's speech, and there is hope for me yet. 
Jeremy in Islington. Very good. OK, and as usual, on Trump, I'm getting zero support, which is exactly what I would expect. Um, it's not the mob rule delaying Trump's visit, Nigel. It's his own thin skin, says Simon. Uh, and Phil says, protesting is not mob rule, it is a right. It sums up Trump's insecurity. He doesn't like to hear that people don't like him. Phil, I think he's got a pretty good idea of that already, and I'm not sure he's that bothered. I suspect uh, that one of the reasons they're concerned about protest is he doesn't want, uh, you know, he doesn't want to be to embarrass the Queen or the government. Uh, but ultimately, we can't be put off by the threat of protest. We are. Yes, it may be a right to stand up, uh, you know, and to protest, but it's not a right, I don't think, to go against the results of elections. And that's what we've seen since Brexit and since the election of Trump. And I think we're beginning to see a bit of that here too. A result in an election, even though it's inconclusive, but it is a result. And there seem to be some on the Labour side who are, be who are behaving as if they'd won and they've somehow been robbed. And the arithmetic simply doesn't back that up. Robert, in Dunwich, what would you like to have seen in today's Queen's speech? Hi, Nigel. A pleasure to speak to you. Look, um... The reason I think that uh, keeping the grammar schools is so important is precisely because we have dummies who are being produced in our education system and who are going on to work at the BBC or in government. <laughs> or in... Right. No, I mean, that, like you say, they don't understand that they've actually lost an election. They don't understand that when you undermine democracy and you turn your country into banana republic, then you are going to be in a much worse state. You may not like a result, but you should respect that result. Now, um, I, I, you know, we, we in, the, in the 60s in this country, we, we moved away from the, the, um, the sciences and we went on the humanities, my boy, and we, everyone in Whitehall was a humanities or a PPE. And of course, we all forgot that it was the Victorian engineers who built this country and made it great X, Y, Z. Look, in Singapore, mm. they are number one in mathematics. They, oh, their, yeah. children, their children are as good as our kids at 16, when, when, they're, when they're 13 years old. Do you know, um, we, do you know we Robert, I, 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 met, I met a couple of years ago, I met an American called Jim Rogers. He's a multi-billionaire, oh, phenomenally know. successful, and yes. makes, yeah, big, yeah. makes big predictions about the global economy. And he, he'd moved to Singapore uh, and had set up home yes. there. And I was yes. chatting with him over, over a cup of tea, and he said, he said, my daughter is 14, and she comes home from school in Singapore, and I can't help her with the homework because it's too advanced for me. So that, <laughs> that, that was the endorsement I got for the Singaporean education well, look, system. I, I was in the market for 23 years. I, I am actually studying to get my PGC as a teacher, and I'm going to go to Singapore because I, 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 I look at a country that, I mean, everyone's moaning about public services and resources, and, we, and, everyone, and it's desperate. I, I actually spent a year as a teacher a few years ago Every public service is under strain. The police, the teachers, the nurses, the doctors. But, but the one thing you're not allowed to talk about is the number of increased demand, the number of increased people who have come to this country. Sure. We can't d debate that. I'm half Caribbean, yeah. right? Yeah. And I get called racist if I bring it up. Do you know, Robert, I've tried. I've tried. I remember the leaders' debate I did back in the 2015 general election. We talked about housing. And, and they all said, we're not building enough houses. And by the way, houses barely got mentioned today in the Queen's speech. We're not building enough houses. And I said, well, it's very difficult to build enough houses if, because of open-door immigration, you haven't got a clue what your population's going to be. And, and I mean, I, I was shouted down, Robert, for what I thought was logic. But back to the Queen's speech and the point. Do you think that the introduction, the opening up of more grammar schools across this country would have, would have been a good thing? I, I absolutely think so, and I, and I tell you, it's not just because I think it would lift standards in those schools, uh, but uh, I think it would lift them across the board. And I, and I know you're under time pressure, but I'll tell you very shortly why, very quickly why. British educationists have got the government over a barrel, and, and, and they, are, they are so left wing, it's unbelievable. They ignore the results of our slide in the international rankings. 22 years in a row, we've slid, gone down compared to other countries. And what would happen with the grammar schools, it, we would show that there is another way to do this, a better way. Robert, what is our current global ranking on education? Well, we're number 27 in maths. We're below Romania. Wow. 
Well, yeah. Robert, Robert, you've made your points beautifully. You've had lots of time. I thank you very much indeed. Foreign aid should be scrapped, screams a text that I get. Jean says on Facebook, ID cards for all and enter postal votes except for the elderly and disabled. Proportional representation. Deport non-patriots. See, Jean, that was all quite logical until we got to that last point. Uh, people are allowed not to be patriotic, are they not? Um, now, I'm going to ask Edward in St Albans. Edward, come on, I must have a caller who thinks today was a great success. Well, first off, thanks for letting me show again. Three straight days, putting St Albans on the map. You're doing um, very well. I don't know how, but you are. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I was going to say that um, I'm not going to agree with that. I'm going to say it was a really bad Queen speech because it just failed democracy. It was against what people voted and it was sort of a, uh, an unfair interpretation of the manifesto. Well, that's not the Queen's fault, is it? That's Theresa May's fault. No, of course I'm not blaming the Queen, but, you know, it's the Queen's speech written by Theresa May, and yep. a lot of the things that were in that manifesto just weren't mentioned. Like, if I just loved killing foxes, and it was, like, one of my favourite things, and I, I sat watching the election result, fox in hand, thinking, oh, I'm going to be able to kill this the second the Conservatives get, you know, a mandate, and then suddenly now my main interest has just been lost, because now that the fox hunting ban is not going to be repealed, and mm. what I voted for is just irrelevant. Well, I don't think the fox hunting bill was going to be repealed anyway. The point was she was going to put it to a free vote. But, Edward, she's dropped vast amounts of the manifesto, and I think you're right. What is the point of voting for manifestos if, within a couple of weeks, they've half disappeared? Edward, I thank you. Malcolm says to me on text, we need reminding that we are the greatest nation in the world, past, present and future, and you are correct about the Commonwealth. Keith in Bristol. Keith... Do you think she got the balance of the speech right, given that many things like dementia tax were a disaster during the campaign? Keith's gone. I'll go to Michael in Hampton. Michael, are you there? Yes, I am. In sunny Hampton. Yeah, well, hello, sunny Hampton. Now, Michael, tell me, what should have been in this Queen's speech? Well, I th what I think is that... Um... The, the, I always thought the manifestos were a wish list anyway. And you, if you put too much stuff in there, you don't, do, you don't do most of it. In my view, the most important thing, and I'm sure you'll agree, is to get Brexit right. Mm -hmm. devote, to, to devote all of her the time, the civil servants and the government, to getting that right. Once you've got that right, then you can look at the other things. Well, in my view, on, and you, yeah. I'm sure... And on that basis, on that basis, Michael, given of the 27 proposed bills for the next two years, eight of them were about Brexit, you could argue that Brexit was front and centre, yes. Yes, that's what we want. Right. Otherwise, so... that, that's the most important thing. The others, fox hunting grammar schools, are important to some people, but to you particularly, I'm sure you're very pleased that Brexit is front and centre, and then there's no excuse. You can devote all this time to it, so they've got to get it right. Well, Michael, I'm pleased you've raised that. I think the Brexit stuff in the Queen's speech... I mean, there was one wishy-washy line about, about putting together a consensus on Brexit. Well, you, if you put together a consensus of people in Parliament, there won't be Brexit at all. Um, but generally, Michael, the bills they're proposing, it sounds encouraging. I would agree with you. Thank you. Yeah, I know that, because I'm a UKIP boy. I came to see you in Gravesend, so I'm not a, I'm not a great supporter of... Uh, Mrs. Uh, May. Uh, May. No. But, uh, you know, but from, from, from what, you fought, what you fought for and what everybody else voted for, 78% of the people wanted immigration. Yeah. And this, this will cover that if Brexit is done properly. If Brexit is done properly and if we got the guts to do the right things afterwards. Michael, I thank you. Keith in Bristol, you're back. You've got 40 seconds to make your point, Keith. What should have happened today in the Queen's speech? I'll be very quick now. I don't really want to speak about that. I want to... Go on. I come from, uh, I want to go back to the referendum night. Uh -huh. uh, I've been trying to speak to you ever since then. Right, well, you're on now, Keith. You've got 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, I want to take you back to just after when you said, when you thought you were going to lose this referendum, you said we'd have to have another referendum. No, I didn't. And, um, yes, you did. No, I didn't. Uh, I heard you. I, I actually heard you. No, you didn't. 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 Keith, did. sorry, matey, but you're talking about an article that appeared in the Daily Mirror when I said there'd be some, particularly some in the Conservative Party, who would not accept the result, but the chances of us getting a second referendum are about zero because Parliament bitterly regrets having given us this opportunity. Keith, I'm sorry it was short, but also, to be fair, Keith, it wasn't to the point. But when we do, one, on whether there should be a second referendum, call and we'll put you straight on. OK, my final thought on this is I would like to see much more on counter-terrorism, not just vague words. A small cut in the foreign aid budget could lead us to being able to arm 
are 120,000 police officers, at least with tasers. Had that police officer on London Bridge had a taser, he'd have stopped the three of them in their tracks and Borough Market wouldn't have happened. That's what I'd like to have seen.